professor of Vanderbilt University. The center hosts Japanese researchers annually at its offices on the Vanderbilt campus and conducts the annual U.S.-Japan Defense Dual Use Technology Forum for American and Japanese businessmen in Nashville. And since 2004, an annual U.S.-Japan Critical Infrastructure Protective Protection Forum in Washington, D.C. Let me tell you that maybe with the exclusion of Lamar Alexander, this fellow's done more for Japanese-American trade than anybody, certainly, in our proximity. Dr. Auer teaches U.S.-Japan relations and the history of sea power to Vanderbilt University graduate and undergraduate students and has served as an adjunct professor of management at Vanderbilt's Owen Graduate School of Management and research professor of the management of technology at the Vanderbilt University School of Engineering. He served in the U.S. Navy from 1963 to 1983 in a number of positions largely in Japan. These included visiting students at the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force Staff College, which is equivalent to the U.S. Navy War College in Tokyo, and commanding officer of a guided missile frigate homeported in Yokosuka from April 79 until September 88. He served as special assistant for Japan in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Now think about that. After spending 10 years or so in Japan, he came back and some sick death with some, some smarts uh, gave him the position of special assistant for Japan. He holds an A.B. degree from Marquette University and a Ph.D. from Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. I would probably have become something other than a naval aviator if I had gone <laughs> to Fletcher School. His thesis, The Post-War Rearmament of Japan, Japanese Maritime Forces in 45 to 71, was published in English by Prager Publishers and in Jap Japanese translation by the Jiji Press under the title Yomagara Nippon Kagan. Excuse me for my pronunciation. In December 2008, he received the Japanese government's Order of the Rising Sun, Gold Raised with Neck Ribbon, award presented by Consul General of Japan in Nashville on behalf of the Emperor of Japan. It's a real honor to introduce Jim Allen. Great. In Russia, in Germany, in England, in France, in Japan, but was not appreciated very highly at the time in the United States of America, his, his, his home country. However, there was one U.S. government official at the time, a obscure at the time, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, who read Mahan and thought that the United States, to be a major power, needed to have overseas bases. And therefore, when the United States went to war with Spain, this Assistant Secretary of the Navy sent a message to the Asia Fleet Commander and said, we're Admiral Dewey, and said, we're at war with, the Phil with Spain, go get the Philippines. And Dewey went and took over. The Philippines were delighted at first. They thought they were going to be independent. And uh, Dewey reported to Washington that he had just taken command of the control of the Philippines. And the administration didn't know what to do. Neither the Secretary of the State or the Secretary of or the President knew that we had just taken over the Philippines and that was not in the war, in the war plan. And President McKinley prayed for three days and got a vision to keep the Philippines. And that was probably the most imperialistic moment in American history from 1898 to 1945, uh, we controlled the Philippines. Who was that obscure se Assistant Secretary Theodore of the Navy? Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt. And I think, as a Navy guy, that was the right thing to do, but it was not our greatest moment of being a non-imperialist power. Second question, why did the United States enter World War I? Well, kind of related to that and follow on. You know, President Wilson ran for and won re-election on the platform of keeping us out of the war. But when Germans started attacking Amer uh, merchant ships with American citizens on board, unrestricted submarine warfare, Roosevelt, or excuse me, Wilson, who was a college professor and had the arrogance of a, of a college professor, said that that act 
is so immoral that he would reverse his position and the United States would enter World War I. And the French and the British, of course, are very happy that we did so. On December 7th, December 8th, 1941, one of the first, first things Franklin Roosevelt did after delivering his war message to Congress, ordered the U.S. Navy to execute unrestricted submarine warfare against Japan. And Japan should have strategically surrendered at the end of 1944 or early 1945 if they had the atomic bombs and the firebombing of Tokyo wouldn't have had to take place. But the Japanese would not do that. But it was the unrestricted submarine warfare which essentially ended Japan's capability to sustain its war efforts. And so here we won World War II with the action that was declared so morally evil that was the only reason we entered World War I. Before I get into my topic, one more quick thing. Uh, you spoke about um, term limits. When I came to Vanderbilt 26 years ago, I shared a part of a building with Alex Hurd, who had retired as chancellor of, of Vanderbilt, but was in the Vanderbilt Public Policy Institute with me. I was the head of the US-Japan Center. He was the head of a special center for the study of the presidency. And Hurd was a bit more liberal than I was, and quite a bit more liberal than I was. But he was a great man and a great uh, believer in democracy. And, and Hurd said that he thought, is it the 22nd Amendment? But limiting the president to two terms was an undemocratic part of the US government. And we should remove the term limit of the president. If the people want to keep their president, they should be allowed to keep their president. My topic tonight is World War II particularly naval parts of it, and particularly the misuse and proper use of cryptography. In 1976, the year of the US bicentennial, I was a Japanese language student in Japan getting ready to, go to, the, to be the first American naval officer to go to the Japanese Naval War College. And the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations invited a very senior elderly Japanese politician who had helped the United States on home porting an aircraft carrier in Yokosuka, the naval port of Tokyo. Uh, the US has never home ported an aircraft carrier outside of the United States before then or since then other than in Japan. And this was a tough sell originally in Japan, but this gentleman had helped to uh, make that possible and so the Chief of Naval Operations and the Secretary of the Navy um, invited him to come to the Tall Ships Parade, uh, which was in New York Harbor at the time, if you remember. And uh, because this gentleman was already 80 years of age, <coughs> as kind of a language exercise, I was ordered to go along as his special aide on that two-week visit. And had to, highlighted by the, the Tall Ships Parade on the 4th of July, 1776 in, in New York. And one of the people I met was a Captain Reserve US Naval officer who had studied the Japanese language, and his name was Roger Pinot. And I got to know Captain Pinot. Uh, Captain Pinot was Samuel Elliott Morrison's research assistant while for Morrison's writings on the Pacific. Fascinated me, and we started corresponding after that. And he told me about a man by the name of Edward Layton. He said that Admiral Kimmel and Admiral Nimitz, his successor, his intelligence officer was a man by the name of Edward Layton. A lieutenant commander, when he served under Kimmel, became a commander, or maybe a captain by the end of the war, serving under Nimitz, retired as a rear admiral. And he was writing a book, his memoir, which was going to be called, And I Was There. And I was, when I was there, that's the first on the list on the sheet that I'm handing out right now. And I Was There was not published until 1985. And I was a great fan of General Douglas MacArthur before I read and I was there. I was th when I, I was there does not necessarily indict MacArthur. It does criticize uh, 
President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and it criticizes Admiral, Vice Admiral Richmond K. Turner, who had been the head, had been the chief of Navy planning in 1941, that thought that he understood the Japanese mind perfectly, and that Japan, under almost no circumstances, would ever attack, would have the gall to attack the United States. Leighton's book, uh, Leighton died before the book was published, and that's why it was published so late. And so the book, Leighton's draft, was given by Mrs. Leighton to Roger Pinot, this captain, Samuel Elliott Morrison's research assistant. And he and a British historical writer by the name of John Costello finished And I Was There, which was published in 1985. And I'll just read one brief excerpt. The book opens with in 1945 with Richmond K. Turner, who distinguished himself as an amphibious commander during some of General MacArthur's landings. But as the chief of war plans, as I mentioned, said that he understood the Japanese psyche and that Japan would never dare to attack the United States. Uh, Leighton was a cryptographer, was an intelligence officer. He had studied Japanese in Japan, had served in our, in our embassy, in Tokyo before the war and helped in the teams that broke the Japanese code. I'll read one section from the introduction of Leighton's book. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor succeeded not just because of their audacious planning and skillful execution, but also, as we shall see, from a dramatic breakdown in our intelligence process. That breakdown was related directly to feuding among high-level naval officers in Washington, D.C. The 7 December catastrophe should have served to quell the feud fueling, feuding and provide a lesson against such failures in the future. It is therefore shocking that within six months of the Pearl Harbor disaster, continued feuding in Washington almost caused us to lose the tide-turning battle at Midway in June of 1942. It is indicative of the extent and seriousness of those failures that the full details in both instances have been, been so successfully concealed from public scrutiny and understanding for so long. As soon as I read this book, I immediately wrote to Captain Pinot again, and I said, not only does this book very much call into question President Roosevelt's strategy of moving the fleet out, first of all, out to Pearl Harbor, and then moving it from Pearl Harbor to the Philippines, and really giving an ultimatum to the Japanese before the Philippines had been reinforced. I said, but it also seems to imply to me that General MacArthur was somewhat derelict. Because unlike Admiral Kimmel and his Army counterpart, General Short, they were not given access to the Japanese codes that were being broken in Washington, D.C. But MacArthur in the Philippines did have access to the Japanese codes. And yet after the attack on Pearl Harbor, almost a day later, MacArthur's planes were still on the ground in, uh, in the Philippines. And even though MacArthur had a standing order, if Japan attacked, he was to immediately initiate attack on, on Taiwan, which he never did. So I asked Pinot about, am I correct in assuming that there's a problem here. And he said, you're absolutely correct. And that book is currently being written by John Costello. Costello's book is the third one listed there on the sheet that I handed out called Days of Infamy, MacArthur, Roosevelt, and Churchill, The Shocking Truth Revealed, How Their Secret Deals and Strategic Blunders Caused Disasters at Pearl Harbor and the Philippines. Uh, Costello is no longer with us. I think he would be younger than I if he were still alive. But in some time in the, the mid-1980s, he was working on a book in, on Russian-Soviet intelligence and the KGB. And mysteriously, Costello died on a, flight, on a flight between Madrid and Miami, Florida. And even though it's never been proven, there are many people and I'm one of them 
who believe that there's a good chance that Costello was poisoned by a Russian agent during that flight, not because of anything he wrote about World War II and my topic tonight, but he was a very, very careful uh, scholar. Uh, in the late, sometime during the Clinton, administ during the Clinton administration, the Senate Armed Services Committee held a hearing on whether General Short and General Kimmel, Admiral Kimmel should have their four-star rank, uh, uh, re uh, not resign, what am I talking about? Re no, no, it was revoked. They, 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 they reinstated. Thomas Moore, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, any number of flag officers, particularly naval officers testified, everybody who testified said that, that MacArthur and Short should have their, their ranks reinstated. The Secretary of the Navy, after getting the report, sent a recommendation to the White House recommending that the ranks be restored. By chance, a student of mine at Vanderbilt, who was an NROTC midshipman, was at the time that the recommendation went from the, from the, Secretary, of the Secretary of the Navy to the White House, he was a lieutenant, legal officer, in the Secretary of the Navy's office. And so he could tell me that the, that the letter did go to the White House uh, recommending that the ranks be reinstated. The ranks were not reinstated. And I have tried to find out why my conclusion, personal conclusion is that somebody worried about the reputation of General MacArthur and FDR essentially got to President Clinton and convinced him not to sign the paper. Again, I can't prove that. You can say it's a conspiracy theory. But I, after reading those, these two books, I'm convinced that there's a very strong case for that. The third book I recommended is the one actually listed there in the, in the, in the middle, Joe Rochefort's War. This is a much more recent book, just came out in 2011. Rochefort was a classmate of Leighton's. And like Leighton, was a Japanese language officer and, uh, and served in Japan. But to be a cryptographer back in the 1940s was considered almost a dishonest or at least a not appropriately military type of duty. And even the intelligence community did not necessarily believe the cryptographers. Now, Leighton was a fairly normal guy, went to the Naval Academy, did serve in Tokyo, did study Japanese language, but he sort of worked up his, his ranks in the Navy, served at sea, uh, commanded a ship following the war before he retired. Rochefort's entire career was as a cryptog cryptographer. I mean, he served a few, I think I served on one or two ships before he went into cryptography. But he is the one that, if you ever heard the term station hypo at Pearl Harbor, which you can still tour, and he wore a gray smoking jacket and smoked a cigarette with a long cigarette holder and was really a very unique but extraordinarily talented person who developed this team of extraordinarily talented civilian men and women who broke the Japanese code. And despite the, the, the fact that we could have at least known more about Pearl Harbor or we could have given General Short and Admiral Kimmel the same kind of information that General MacArthur had, and which could have possibly minimized the damage. And again, to me, there's absolutely no excuse for MacArthur having his planes grounded. Uh, as I mentioned, Admiral Turner and his boss, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral King, absolutely did not trust cryptography. And very, very fortunately, Admiral Nimitz, who replaced Admiral Kimmel after Kimmel was fired for his dereliction of duty, even though he wasn't given the full information, Admiral Nimitz believed Rochefort. And Rochefort said, the Japanese are going to attack Midway. And of course, he was correct. And Nimitz believed him. And Nimitz, in a way, put his own career on the line <coughs> against King by saying, I believe they're going to attack Midway and we're going to defend Midway. And of course, and has anyone read Incredible Victory by Walter Lord? 
on the Battle of Midway, it really was an incredible victory. Even reading the Japanese code, it was absolutely miraculous that we happened to catch the Japanese carriers while they were changing ammunition, and that we got out four of their five carriers in a 20-minute period of time. The uh, success of Midway, King and, and Turner didn't credit. They said, well, Rochefort, uh, Admiral, Admiral uh, Nimitz recommended Rochefort for a very high award, and King wouldn't approve it. He got a lower, a lower level that Rochefort was one of a team, but there wouldn't have been a team without Rochefort. The Costello book came out, and I think that's written there on the back of the sheet that you have, it contains allegations that FDR's plan to denude Hawaii by moving America's first line of defense from Hawaii to the Philippines by sending B-17s and B-24s to the Philippines Islands needed three to six months more to complete in, the, in late 1941. Not necessarily a bad strategy, but FDR suddenly decided to abandon the tactic of stalling for time with Japan via negotiations and made sudden demanding conditions to Tokyo. FDR did this in Costello's view as a concession to Churchill who feared the UK would be forced to fight alone if the US were not attacked along with Malaya, Singapore, etc. FDR caved to Churchill without consulting with Congress and without providing code-breaking information to Kimball and Short in Hawaii while giving the same info to MacArthur in the Philippines. Costello makes a strong case that Admiral Kimmel and Short were made scapegoats to cover for the president after Pearl Harbor disaster. More sensationally, Costello makes the case that MacArthur did not attack Taiwan as he was ordered to do if war broke out, owing to a bribe from Philippine President Manuel Quezon, who hoped that the Japanese might bypass the Philippines if no U.S. attack came from the Philippines. That's kind of my quick pitch, and I'd be glad to have people tell me you're full of crap hour, and you should go back to being a sailor rather than a scholar. But that was what I wanted to, the message I wanted to bring. Oh, one more final book. Two, actually, if you'll permit me. Anybody know the name of Albert C. Wiedemeyer? General Wiedemeyer, yes. General Wiedemeyer is a biography of Wiedemeyer. I happened to meet General Wiedemeyer uh, uh, late in his life, and it was a very great honor to meet him. His family had a beautiful farm outside of Washington, D.C., in Boyds, Maryland. And uh, he had books in his library to Al, my, with good best wishes, Herbert Hoover, and just a, a very wonderful gentleman and warrior. But Wiedemeyer became famous for the Wiedemeyer reports because he went out to investigate what was going on in China and wrote a book, uh, a report to President Truman on how the United States lost China when China went communist. Does anybody know why Wiedemeyer was assigned to the Asian theater about midway during the war of 42 or 43? Wiedemeyer was the strong, Wiedemeyer had, unlike these guys who studied in Japan, Wiedemeyer as a major or a lieutenant colonel, I think as a major, attended the German Army War College. And he had spoken with Hitler. And FDR had quite a strong respect for Wiedemeyer. Wiedemeyer was arguing that Normandy should have taken place not in 1945, but in, excuse me, in 1944, but should have taken place in 1942 or 1943. And even though we were not as strong as we would have we were in 1994. The Germans were also not stronger, and we would have saved hundreds of thousands of American lives had we attacked in 1942 or 1943, 1944. Roosevelt was somewhat impressed with Wiedemeyer's arguments, but Churchill was so strongly against that because he thought the British would suffer so greatly if the attack took place in 42 or 43 that to keep good relations with China, Roosevelt sent Wiedemeyer out to, to, uh, to Asia, and he ended up writing that report on China. One final book that's, well, and the Wiedemeyer book is not listed there either. The title of the book is General Albert C. Wiedemeyer, American's Unsung Strategist in World War II. The author is John J. McLaughlin. Another book that it was very interesting. It was called Cruise of the Lanikai, L-A-N-I-K-A-I, 
written by a lieutenant junior grade at the time, Camp Ta Ta excuse me, the, the Lanakai in 1941 was commanded, it was a schooner uh, that had been around since World War I, commanded with a diesel engine on it, could carry maybe a crew of six, but it was commissioned with Lieutenant J.G. Tolly put on ch in charge of it with a Philippine crew. And as a rear admiral, after he retired, Tolly wrote the book, The Cruise of the Lanakai, which basically gave his opinion that I was put out there to have the Japanese attack me so that, that the Japanese would fire the first shot rather than we firing the first shot at the Japanese. Before Tali ever got out there, uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked, and so Tali was ordered back into port. Um, so that's another book, if you're interested in this topic, the Naval Institute published Tali's memoir, and um, it, it, to me, is, is a very good comp companion to these other volumes I mentioned. And with that, I'll shut up and take your questions. Pearl Harbor, we could have, uh, Kimmel and Short, in my opinion, would have interpreted the messages from, that Washington had and that MacArthur had much more strongly if they had, had access to them, but they weren't given access to them. Uh, I don't think the Japanese capture of our code was nearly as complete as our capture of, but even in our case, we didn't have 100%. Um, but uh, it is, of course, greatly helpful to have it, but even though we had it, some of our most senior officials refused to sort of believe it. And again, particularly Admiral Turner, I hate to pick on him uh, because he was a great surface naval warfare officer and that's what I was supposed to be. But he, he again thought that he knew Japanese psychology and, uh, and what they would do far better than any cryptographer guy sitting down in a, in a room in Pearl Harbor. Taiwan, of course, was Japanese territory at the time. But he was supposed to launch an air attack against Taiwan. But the planes never took off. And again, this story about President Quizon of the Philippines, he was a national hero in the Philippines, and he was pro-American. But again, I read for the first time in Costello's book that, I mean, the Japanese had quite a navy in 1941, and Quezon thought that the, that the Japanese might win, and therefore, Again, Costello is arguing here that Quezon possibly thought that if the Philippines were not involved in directly attacking the Japanese and there was some kind of modus vivendi between the U.S. and Japan, where Japan controlled the, the Western Pacific and we stayed to the east, that the Philippines might stare better. And after the war was over, I don't remember the exact year, but a $500,000 deposit was made to MacArthur's account. And that, I believe, has been documented elsewhere. By whom? Ever called upon? No. To explain why he left those planes on the ground? No. And Turner, who thought he could outthink the Japanese, wasn't called to task either. Because MacArthur and Turner, at the end, you know, had these great amphibious landings. And so MacArthur became a great hero. Um, Again, maybe I'm too much of a naval thinker, but yes, those MacArthurian battles were great and the ones Turner led, but the thing that really strategically killed Japan was the sinking of Japan's commerce by U.S. Navy submarines. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there was quite an argument between uh, Nimitz and MacArthur as to whether the Philippines should be retaken or the Philippines should be skipped. And of course, MacArthur had made his famous statement of, I shall return. And so he wanted to go back to the Philippines, and he did. Uh, waited ashore three times until they got the picture correct. Uh, but uh, there are still people that argue that it wasn't really absolutely necessary, strategically, to take the Philippines at that time. And of course, it cost us a lot of, of lives there. Well, well, why did nobody? Because we won. I mean. But why did nobody question MacArthur at the time? Why, why well. The only ones that are doing it, because again, they, he became a war hero. Now some scholars, like Costello and these cryptography offers, are, are questioning that very much. But you know, most people, they know who won. They don't know the details of how you got there. But I, I think he certainly should have been questioned. 
because without the end of the war, MacArthur might have been tried if, in fact, he did violate a direct order to initiate this attack against Taiwan. Was there any discussion at all why he didn't? Um, I, I would need to read Costello again a little bit uh, more uh, once again because it's been a few years since I read it. But supposedly, and again, how far this went down in his staff, I don't even know. But he wasn't called. He was sleeping at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack and wasn't immediately called. Again, whether that was based on his orders or based on one of his subordinates who knew that he didn't want to do this or what, I, but I don't know. Yes. Down to Truman. Right. And even, and of course we know what happened with Truman, but even FDR, I think, worried about MacArthur as a political force and was afraid, probably was afraid to look into MacArthur's record because MacArthur was the great hero after the war was over. And Richmond K. Turner got a beautiful ship named after him, a guided missile cruiser. Um, but again, he did, as an amphibious commander, uh, late in the war did very well, but his actions as chief of naval war plans were disgraceful as far as I'm concerned. I mean, even after Midway, King and, and, uh, and Turner were unwilling to give any credit to Rochefort. I don't think Rochefort, I, Rochefort did get some low-level decoration, but only because of what Admiral Nimitz did. But if Nimitz hadn't believed Rochefort, that in fact we had correctly detected that the attack was coming to Midway. You know the famous thing where they sent out the false message that AF was the symbol for Midway. AF's water supply is broken. They sent out in plain language, Midway's water supply is, uh, is down. And all of a sudden a Japanese message came through, AF is without water. And that convinced, convinced Nimitz particularly that Rochefort was right. Fortunately, he believed him. Jim, have you read?